Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. We are going to answer questions from last week's videos. Aaron is mic'd up um, and it's on, right? Yeah. You got it on? Yeah. I got to check mine. I did a whole video last week where I forgot to turn on my mic. <laughs> so that can prove problematic if I don't have the camera really close to me and my mic is running. So uh, we did five videos this week rather than four, which I think the last few weeks has just been four videos. So we are starting to rev up a little bit. And our forecast, like this week, toward the end of the week, we have a day in the mid 60s. So it looks like things are on the up and the ups, uptick, upswing. So it's looking good. Before we get into the videos though, I did want to announce the winners of the Felco Harvesting Shear giveaway. They're like little snips. Russell is like all up in my business too right now. Um, They've come out with a new line of these snips that will be out toward the end of this month, the end of March. I don't have an exact day, um, and we did a whole video unboxing them this week, and they sent us two of each type of snips. So there's a 320, 321, and 322. So I have the winners. The winner of the 320 snip is Jake Cindy. Jake Cindy won. Um, congratulations. The winner of the 321 is Ginny, and 322 is Kathy. We have reached out to each one of you guys. Has anybody responded yet? Yeah, Kathy has so Kathy far. Kathy has? Awesome. Well, congratulations to the three of you. I'm excited for you to get them in your hands for you to, um, to try them out. And I think the 322 is already my snip or shear of choice. It's the one that's straight blade that's a little bit longer, but I really need to use them all, all three of them a little bit more just to kind of get a feel for, for it. And I'll, I think, have the opportunity here really soon with things kind of wake it up. Also, just to clarify, if anyone gets an email or oh, a message yeah. saying that you won something, we will never ask for anything more than a shipping address. Yeah, that is And maybe all... a phone number. Sometimes we need a phone number for right. shipping, depending on the And we item. only pick winners from YouTube. So if you're getting messages on Facebook from some random garden answer page that's not spelled properly or I that's I just got weird. a couple emails this morning from people saying, you emailed me saying that I won $1,000. Oh, um, yeah. Is this real? And Nothing no, on Facebook is, not is real. real in terms of a giveaway from us. Um, that's just a scammy page trying to get information from you. So don't give them any information, please. Okay, moving on. First video of this week was the first tree load of 2021. So Aaron and I were able to break away for a few hours on a Saturday, it was Aaron's birthday, and his mom came over, watched the kids while we ran down to the garden center to pick out some trees. And I just have to say, like, he wanted to go pick out trees. I know it was his birthday. Everyone was like, oh, what a good husband on his birthday picking out trees. He's equally as excited as I am. Like we're both invested in this project pretty I'm not pretty as hard. interested in, in picking out the trees as I am just furthering the process of yeah. getting Anything trees planted like on the move, new property. Uh, move the process along and projects along. Like yeah. you I'm feed more excited about the property the, getting yeah. like um, I don't know what the word is. Yeah. Like move moved along. <laughs> so it was something that he wanted to do. <laughs> I just wanted to put that out there. Um, but they got in oh five hundred and do you remember how many she said? 570 some, a 77 lot. trees. Maybe I'm inflating that a little bit, I might be. Um, but there were a lot of brand new trees and they were all still tied up, but it's still equally as exciting. So Megan said, have you ever done a video on weeping willows? I have a wet area in my yard that a willow would be perfect for, but I'm wondering what other plants or shrubs would work with, uh, would work well with it. Uh, I have not done a video on weeping willows. I love them. We've got three in our yard and they do like a wet situation. So, I mean, if you've got a wet area, they're great. They are a kind of a weak tree. I mean, if you have a windstorm, you will have little limbs below them. You do have to treat them with a systemic, well, no, maybe not in your area. In our area, you have to treat them with a systemic insecticide once a year to keep the borers out. If you don't do that, if you miss a year, they will get borers. It will make them weaker and they'll lose big branches eventually. Um, so it's just, and then the systemic insecticide, like I'm, you gotta be careful about when you use that. We always use it right after they're done blooming. So the systemic lasts for the growing season. And then by the time the bees are feeding on the blooms the next year, it's exited the tree system. So it doesn't hurt any bees. Um, you just have to be very responsible about when you're using it. But they're a great tree in terms of beauty. I mean, they're gorgeous. Um, a little bit more work in terms of pruning, but a couple other things that I have used in wet areas. Uh, paper bark maple has done fairly well in our last garden. Our last garden had very wet soil and I used birch trees are really great as well. Um, dogwoods, not the tree form, the shrub form of dogwoods, really good for moist areas. Alder trees and they produce tiny little cones that are really beautiful for decorating. Um, in terms Elderberries? of- Elderberries? Yeah, yeah, elderberries would be great. 
Um, I planted currants, currant shrubs in that back corner that did really good. Asters, Joe Pie weed. Um, you know, I'm probably forgetting. Oh, hibiscus. The big dinner plate hibiscus. Those are actually termed a bog plant. So you can put those in a wet area and have them do really well. Am I forgetting anything, Erin? Do you remember anything else I had in that spot? Um, no. There's probably, like, if you guys have more additional things that do well in a wet area, please leave the that information down below because I think a lot of people would appreciate. <laughs> I don't know. There's always a lot of good information It'd in the comments section. It'd be a good video to do, uh, to do, like, a compilation like a, of things. Yeah, that's a good idea. Add it to the list. Uh, Brandy said, I'm not having luck with local garden centers on finding dwarf varieties of fruit trees. Do you have any suggestions for reputable businesses to order from online? And I, I included your question because um, that you weren't the only one who asked that. There were quite a number of you who asked about a tree source online, and I unfortunately just don't have one. I've never ordered trees online. Do you know of a, like an online order place? Like mm, No. I mean, I, we've, we've been approached by some. Um, to do like sponsorships or whatever, but uh -huh. like we don't just, we just, we don't do sponsorships with people we don't have experience with. Yeah, right. Um, so. Like in that case, we'd say ship us some of your stuff. We'll yeah. grow it for a few years and we'll decide yeah, if it's worth right. it at that point. Um, what I would do, so one of the biggest tree suppliers in the country, I think is Schmidt, JF Schmidt. Um, we'll link them down below. I know that they ship, they've got, I think they've got more than one location, but they ship uh, nationwide. Um, you might contact them and see where the nearest retailer is to you. Uh, I think that would be a good place to start anyway. I'll bet J.F. Schmidt would hate that. You think so? I feel like they're the type, they, they wouldn't want to be contacted because um, oh. they, they're just the grower. Um, so we won't link them down below? <laughs> I, I feel like maybe it would be... Contact your local garden center, rather. Yeah, yeah, or yeah. Or the nearest local garden center to you. Yeah, and, how about that? Contact yeah. your local garden center and say, do you order from J.F. Schmidt? Or who do you order from and, like, how old are the trees? Yeah. What's the quality? That sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. That's why Aaron's mic'd up. <laughs> <laughs> Can well, you answer I have things gotten, better than I can. I have gotten emails from companies before who are like, we do not ship to the public. Like, please do not <laughs> send <laughs> people. Don't talk about us. Yeah. Jessica said, have you guys thought about a skid loader instead of a forklift? Yeah. So, okay, here's my thoughts on a skid steer is, one, they're, from my understanding, a lot more expensive. Mm. Um, they can be more expensive to maintain. They're a lot heavier. Which we don't know how to maintain stuff like no, that. No, I'm have to not hire, mechanically like, inclined yeah. at all. Um, you can't really run them on the grass very well from what I understand because of how heavy they are. They tend to, especially the ones with tracks, I think they really tear up your grass. Mm. Um, so between the expense, and then I also don't think, I was doing some research and it doesn't sound like um, the smaller ones can really lift that much. Um, you know, like you're capping out at around like the 2000 mark, maybe mm. 3000. Whereas if we went with a forklift, like a smaller forklift can do like 5,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. So, man, but a skid steer can do so many different things too. But I've also heard that the attachments are expensive as well. Yeah, that's something to consider. But, you know, if you get a forklift, all it does is lift. However, that's the majority of what we need. Right. We just it's move true. things around from one place to another. Mm -hmm. So that's like 90% of what we're looking for. And then Chad is so awesome to move dirt around. Yeah. That if we ever have like a large amount of dirt that needs to get mm -hmm. moved um, or leveled out, mm -hmm. he's the easiest because he comes in with his huge yeah. equipment. He actually leaves his equipment on our property a lot. Yeah. <laughs> like, he comes and he, because he works us in kind of between projects um, a lot. He spends a lot of time here, though, too, working on specific yeah. projects for us. But, like, if we have something little or we're not in a hurry, like, he's got his big road grinder out here and it's been, I mean, it snowed. So, like, he couldn't really use it anywhere else. So, he's just left it here. It's just chilling out. Benjamin loves it because yeah. he loves to go visit the equipment. But, yeah, he'll just leave his stuff out. I'm like, can you leave a key? Yeah. <laughs> can you, like, give us some instruction on how to use this? Because sometimes this skid steer's here for a long time. Yeah. Like, several weeks. Yeah. Because um, he's got multiple probably of, anyway. I don't know where I was going with that. But you were talking about how easy and he is to get here and how much yeah. better and he has, is at it. Yeah. It so... takes practice. Since we have Chad, it's really hard for me to think about like, oh, I need all the equipment to do that myself. Yeah. When he does such a good job at such a reasonable rate. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's nice to have him around. Yep. 
Um, Stephanie said, beautiful fruit trees. I'm in Canada Zone 5B. Which fruit tree would you suggest? You could do pretty much all of the fruit trees that I showed. Um, boy, because we, we've we just recently moved to a Zone 6, which I think that question is later on in like how... 6B now. We're a 6B now, which makes sense. It's based off a 10-year average. So they take a 10-year average of what your win winters have been like, and that is your growing zone. So since we've had so many, like three or four very mild winters in a row, like very mild it has naturally moved us up but that doesn't mean we can't get down like you know we had that one weird winter where it got really like negative temperatures and lots of snow um so you know don't really know exactly what to do like we still kind of plant where, like we're a zone five i don't even know what to do like there's we some have, things i want would love to plant that are a zone six but it still makes me nervous yeah we have freak weather yeah you know how it's like like the blizzard yesterday yeah or, was that two days ago? I don't remember when it was three days ago. <laughs> it um, it's it's very like predictable. Mm -hmm. You know, the summers are hot, the winters are pretty mild, mm -hmm. but every once in a while you get that crazy winter or that crazy temperature where yeah. it's like negative. Which I think most every area probably gets that, don't you think? Every area is probably. subject to some kind of a freak storm or whatever. Some places are more reliable in terms of like they get a reliable amount of of moisture Rainfall. or like a mm -hmm. reliable amount of snow. Right. But we go some years with no snow. Right. So anyway, zone 5B, those are all the fruit trees that we typically bring in down at the garden center. So usually we have apples, cherries, nectarines, peaches, plums, pears, all those random ones like the aprium, pluots, um, uh, what's the other ones? I don't know, there's prune. Um, we will get almonds, flowering almonds, or the almond trees. Um, pawpaws, which I'm not very familiar with, but those are some that we bring in. Um, Am I forgetting some? Probably. But yeah, zone, those are all good for zone five. So I think you're good to go on pretty much everything. Definitely double check because there are some varieties that are a little bit higher on the zone scale, maybe like a zone six. So double check the exact variety that you're planting because there's always the one-offs, but I think you're pretty good for most everything. Um, Ellen White said, can you please tell me where to buy the log arch in the background to the right of Erin? I've never seen one before. So that is the beginning to my mom's stumpery, stumpery she's creating in the back. So she had the kind of this vision for a log arch and then the guys down at the garden center built it. So one of the guys who's actually the um, seed plant foreman, he's a manager of, of the seed plant, he built like this uh, iron kind of, it's a solid iron hoop kind arch. of thing, arch but it's kind of shaped more circular, like okay. it comes down like more circular. Instead of coming down and then going straight down into the ground, it does uh -huh. like this. And then one of the guys down there wired, like individually wired the logs to the arch. So there's really not a lot to it infrastructure wise. And I think the guys did a great job putting it together and it's a really neat look. And then there was a guy that brought in a bunch of stumps. I think he traded my mom pies. Really? Yeah. My mom's like, oh, I like those stumps. I wonder if I could get more of those stumps. And he said he would do it in exchange for pies. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we roll around here. Uh, anyway, I think she's going to do some really neat plantings and stuff in that area. So that's just the beginning of it. So we'll probably tour it at some point. Colleen said, happy belated birthday to Erin. One of the most exciting things to me about birthdays is all the delicious foods I'm going to eat that day. What was your favorite thing you ate on your birthday? And what's your ideal birthday dinner and dessert? Did we do that uh, that barbecue place on my birthday? I don't remember. I think um, I think we ordered DoorDash and had um, smoke and frannies. Yeah, smoke. It was a place that we never had before, and I think it's like out of a truck. Yeah. Um, At the yeah, truck it was stop. like a. It was good. I got uh, like three different types of meat. It was a uh, pork. So you got brisket. Brisket and ribs. Bar and ribs. Ribs. And baked beans. Yeah, so the there you go. Baked beans were good. Yeah. Yeah. So what's your ideal birthday dinner and dessert? Is that your ideal birthday dinner? Because I, like, if I were to guess, I would say you would want pizza. Yeah, I'm a big fan of pizza, ribs, and um, that, that rice that you make. The Fried rice? Fried rice. Really? Yeah, with Like, the that's eggs. on the top of your favorite that's food That's really scale? high. Well, that with, uh, with, like, sweet and sour chicken. Mm, yeah. Really good. What about a dessert? I get it. I could guess this one, too. Oh, dessert. Mm -hmm. um, something chocolate. Warm chocolate chip cookies. Oh yeah, there you go. I know. Warm you. chocolate chip cookies um, with ice cream though too. Chocolate ice cream? Maybe vanilla. Actually. Really? Yeah. You never go for vanilla. No, but with chocolate chip, uh, chocolate chips, especially mm -hmm. warm ones. Mhm. Mm That's pretty good. So there you go. I don't even know if I have an ideal dinner, or an ideal dessert. I like all the things except for the things that you like. <laughs> 
<laughs> Aaron loves pizza. I'm like, I'm indifferent about pizza. I think that's probably the biggest one. Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. Tina said, love to see Aaron is looking out for you, Laura. I was lifting the fruit tree. Um, you said firestone when showing us trees. What exactly is that? I think what, what I said was freestone. It probably, I probably said it so fast it sounded different. Um, but freestone, you can get peaches that are freestone or nectarines that are freestone or clingstone. Um, and the freestone peaches, the flesh peels right away from the pit instead of clinging to the pit. So freestones are much easier to like um, cut apart because you don't have to cut them away from the pit. Andrew said, are you guys going to be planting any evergreens? Yes, and I didn't mention that in this video. We were looking at all deciduous trees because that's what this load was. Um, we've already got three blue spruces that will get quite large. Like, I think those get like uh, 50, is it, does it say 40 to 50 feet or 50 to 60 feet? Do you remember? Big. Probably they get 50. big and 20 feet wide. Um, so we've got three of those already. And then once we get the evergreen load in down at the garden center, we'll probably go pick some things out. Um, but we want a really good mix of both in that area. I know Aaron wants some legacy trees and it seems like evergreen varieties can get huge over time and be wonderfully majestic. Yes. Are there varieties that do well in your area? Spruce trees do the very best. Well, spruce and junipers. We've got a huge juniper on the west side of our house um, that the previous owner said was original to the original house, which is 1919. I don't know if that's true. I mean, mm. I it's huge. It's massive. And junipers are pretty long-lived. I mean, they're native here. Yeah. They do well here. So junipers and spruce do really well. Pines do okay, but you guys know, like we had ours removed because they had blight and they do get blight here. Um, and that's a bummer because you can't really, you can't fix it. You can like prevent it from, from getting worse, but you can't ever restore the tree back to its former, former glory. So you hate to get like a big pine tree up to a beautiful size and have it be such a cornerstone of your garden, a cornerstone piece, and then have something happen to it. Um, but spruces, spruces are those for me, like those wonderfully majestic trees, like the big blue spruce in our entryway. I love that tree. Devin said, when did your growing zone change? So I answered that earlier. It changed last year to a six. Yeah. Yeah. And now six B this year. Yeah. Because of our other, I think our lowest temperature this year was 16. Not too shabby. Uh, Greg said, is 500 trees a typical amount of trees your parents order? And is that for the season? No, that's just the first load. So they've got another load coming in. In fact, we're waiting on that one for some more decorative stuff. The load they got this time was kind of like our standard stuff. Um, the, like some of the best sellers, the stuff we use in a lot of, like his anchor pieces and a lot of landscape plans. So that was that load. Um, so boy, they typically order in, I want to say they get at least five orders that big and that's just from one company. And then they order in, we get weekly loads from probably three or four different growers, um, annuals, perennials, shrubs. Um, they get in probably five huge perennial orders every year too that's got like probably over a thousand pieces and then well that's huge to me i don't know it's it's all relative yeah it's all relative but um and then we get in probably two or three loads from isley which is the specimen evergreen uh, company beautiful stuff and that one usually you've got a ton of pieces too so i don't know i mean a lot of things and then the roses i think they do you remember how many thousands of roses they get in i don't a lot but they get in a lot from Weeks Roses, David Austin. They are supplier of David Austin Roses, which there are very few. And I think they've pulled a lot. It seems like they're year. selling a lot online now. They are. They're doing a lot of like online Like they're sales. switching to, uh, to like preferring people buy online. Yeah. I wonder if they're trying to get people to buy um, root. What's that called? Bear root. Bear root. Mm -hmm. Which I ordered some bear root ones and I was very happy with. The, the thing is, is that I ordered some varieties that my mom wasn't able to get on her order at a certain point. Like they only allow, I, I don't know, my mom had ordered so many of them and so many varieties, but there was a, like two varieties, one or two varieties that I really wanted that she didn't, uh, that either weren't offered on hers or it was too late to order them. Anyway. Um, so I was able to experience what their bare root ones are like, and they were really good. Jessica said, what did you end up picking out for Aaron's mom? I didn't actually, I let her know the things that were there. I just, I felt like that we should wait for that second load where there were some more specialty things so that she could really have a choice of all the different varieties. Because like I said, the, the trees that were there were a lot of standard stuff. And I would have picked a Autumn Brilliance service berry for her, but she's got one very nearby. Like it would have been side by side service berry trees. Um, I think another good option would be the spring snow crab apple. I think that they would really enjoy that tree. But I think waiting for that second load is the best idea. 
Kelly said, do you have to have two of the same kind of fruit trees for them to cross pollinate in order to grow or set fruit? Only on some varieties. So some you'll find that are self pollinating or self fruitful and some require a pollinator. So you just have to look at the tag to determine that. Or if the tag doesn't say, just do a quick Google search to be sure, because it would be such a bummer if you brought a fruit tree home thinking like, oh, I'm gonna get apples this year. And then not knowing that you got one that you actually need to have two in order for them. And I mean, that takes up a lot more space to have two trees as opposed to one. Um, so definitely, uh, worth looking into before you make your final purchase. And then Kelly, I don't, um, I did not include it, but I meant to. I think you asked another question about chilling requirement. So the tag did uh, say that like 500 hours of chilling requirement was required for that specific variety. And that means that that tree needs uh, like between a range of 32 to 50 degrees, they need to experience a cold period for that amount of hours in order to be productive. So that's what that means. Okay, next video was new garden stuff unboxing. We had some, the snips from Felco. We had a bunch of boxes from Gardener Supply that showed up. And then Aaron bought a couple of new sprayers, DeWalt sprayers down at Home Depot. So we just wanted to go through all those things. It was kind of a, um, it was a nice project to do up here in the cozy sun porch that day. Um, Barbara said, are the Felco 322 snippers harvesting shears handles small enough for smaller hands? When they are opened, are the handles too wide for smaller hands? And no. In fact, my hands don't even show up on the measuring scale that Felco has. So like mine would be considered an extra small, which I don't, I think my hands are pretty average size for a female, honestly. Um, and those snips are perfectly comfortable in my hands. I would say that the, um, the short or the straight shears for me felt more comfortable. I don't, I don't know if the handle is shaped differently, but the ones with the curve on them, they, I don't know if the curve just throws me off, but it didn't feel as comfortable to me as the ones with the straight blade. Sarah said, is it normal to salivate when someone says they are unboxing from Gardener Supply and also giving away some new Felco garden snippers? I think that's totally normal. Uh, Nina said, can you use fertilizer in the DeWalt sprayers? I would probably, oh, that's a, that's a hard one because you wanna make sure whatever you're using inside of a sprayer is completely water soluble because if you've got an organic, like that's gonna plug up that sprayer so fast. Yeah, I would say no, because I think that it would filter out um, like too small of, yeah. I, I, would, I would say no. It wouldn't come out fast enough. You would, it would take forever to unload. And it always seems know, like even with a gallons. synthetic that like is water soluble, you always end up with like a little tiny bit at the bottom. Yeah. Cause I think you'd have to use either warm water or stir it forever to get it com to completely dissolve. Mm -hmm. I would say no. That would be awesome though. That would be great. AHT said, could you use that green truck on the wheel frame for flower cutting or do you think water would just slosh everywhere? I think it depends on your terrain. For me, it would slosh everywhere because I would have to take it over, you know, the dirt paths out in the garden and then around gravel. If you were taking yours down sidewalk though and you had kind of like a smooth area to take it, I think that you could completely put water in there and use it for cut flowers. That would be handy. Dee said, I would like a pair. Also, are you still considering hiring for an assistant position? Yes. Yeah. We're actually looking for somebody to help, not really like assistant, it's just more of like a gardener, somebody mm -hmm. who can come and water plants and somebody who knows plants, who can read plants. We're looking for a plant lover. Yeah. Like someone who cares, mm -hmm. uh, who understands how to fertilize. And who's how, fussy. Yeah, 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 fussy I need plants. somebody who's fussy. Who's like type, type A with a plants. Fussy with plants. Um, realizing that I'm also type A fussy with plants who can handle me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> handle my personality. Like, you know, I, it's hard for two type A's to work together sometimes. Yeah. So it, yeah. So yeah, we have, um, advertised, like you put out, out on Facebook just personally uh -huh. and you've had a few people inquire and apply. Yeah. So it's something, a, a position like just part-time really even that we're looking for. It doesn't really even, it could be full-time though. It could be. Yeah. I think it could easily be full time. Um, so, yeah, if anyone's interested, yeah, <laughs> send, want to me relocate. The, send me your resume. <laughs> yeah. Marla said, My lemon cypress never have made it through the winter. What's your secret? A ton of water. A ton of water. Even up here in the sun porch, um, where they stay a lot cooler, I um, we water them at least once a week, if not more. Um, we come out here because I do run a small floor heater, just take the edge off in here. And it, it stays a lot cooler, which if they're in the house, I have to water them definitely more than once a week in our dry climate to keep them happy. And I find that that's probably key as well. Bright light and a ton of water. 
Uh, we did do a video though, however, on lemon cypress. So if you care to watch that, we should link that down below. It's actually when I brought all of these in here because typically I do keep them over inside and I just, they're a lot more maintenance because it's a lot warmer inside and they've been so fantastic out here. I think I'll do this every year. It's like kind of a good interim spot for things to be in terms of temperature. Okay, next video was spring flowers and potting up artichokes and ornamental kale. So I actually had to refilm the intro of that video because I either deleted the footage or I never pushed record and I just recorded a bunch of stuff or thought I was recording a bunch of stuff when I wasn't, which happens occasionally, but I reorganized in the greenhouse, kind of tidied everything up, moved a whole table out, potted up some spring flowers, um, and there was a lot of it that I missed. Anyway, um, yeah. What else? Oh, and then um, my artichokes and ornamental kale needed to be bumped up in container size. The kale is now out in the greenhouse or the cold frame rather where it can grow on where it's cooler because apparently that's what the package told me to do. And um, apparently they color up better if they're out in a cooler, like subjected to 50 degrees ish temperatures. And then the artichokes were potted up and then moved back into the studio where it's warmer. So uh, Mary said, girl, will you take off your pretty wedding band while you dig in the soil? If by pretty wedding band, well, first of all, I paint all over my hands because I've been painting in the studio, but um, this is like a $5 wedding band. I never wear my real wedding band. So if you've watched like progression of videos through the year, like my wedding ring changes all the time. In fact, I think this is the $5 one I bought when my hands got so swollen when I was pregnant. And like, it's a lot looser now. I still have some work to do, but <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I haven't worn my, my real wedding ring for a lot of years. Anyway, it's kind of fun getting cheap ones and changing out the style. Jessica said, when transferring from grow lights to greenhouse or the uh, tunnel, do you need to harden them off or can you just bring them out? It depends on the plant. Like with those kale, um, they're such cold tolerant plants anyway. And I provided an extra protection even inside the cold frame. You know, I brought that little, it was the cover for my two by four elevated raised bed from Gardener Supply. And I did happen to not have anything in that raised bed right now. So I thought, well, this is perfect. I popped it off and put it on the floor so that I had double layer protection over those kale, but knowing that they are cold tolerant anyway, they did fine not hardening, hardening them off. It's always a good idea though, if you have a chance to do that and you're, you're going to be moving something from a very warm protected spot to somewhere that doesn't have kind of the same conditions, just to do it over a gradual uh, period of time. That way you don't shock the poor plants. Sandra said, do you have a list of seeds that you bump up to four inch pots? Typically, I try not to have to do a ton of that. Usually, I'm having to do that if I've started things too early that um, I just like have overgrown their space. Like last year, I didn't have the proper sweet pea pots, and so I just did them in my regular seed trays, and I had to. I had to pot them up, and I had like 90 of them that I had to pot up into four-inch cans because I started them just a little bit too early. This year, I'm using root trainers, so proper containers, which that video will be out here soon for you guys to see and I started them a little bit later and I'm waiting like my tomatoes I'm not starting till the very last week of March um, and typically like last year I started everything so early everything was big and um, it's hard not to it's hard not to do that though because we all get very excited and then I get a little worried too like well I wonder if it's not gonna be big enough when I'm ready to plant they are big enough usually and then you don't have to bump stuff up but like the artichokes it's just one of those crops that um, need to be bumped up in size because you have to start them early enough. And anyway, yeah. So no, I don't have a list. I don't know how to best answer that, except for I try to avoid that at all costs. Uh, Amy said, where do you purchase all of your terracotta pots? Down at my parents' garden center. Gina said, those daffodils are perfect for that pot and I'm loving that hanging plant with the rosemary. So there's one in the very back of the greenhouse. It's in, do you remember what it's called, Erin? It's the, it's from Kinsmen. It's like, I've had them for years. I planted like a hanging basket in them years ago in a video. Yeah, I don't know what it's from, but we should place an order with Kinsmen. They have a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, they do. But it's kind of like... <laughs> off topic. <laughs> well, it's not off topic. That's kind of on topic, but it's kind of like... It's all one piece. You asked, I think, if it was one piece or two. It's one piece. It's like kind of crown-ish. It's got more detail to it. Um, a Monica said, how come your outdoor pots do not bust open from frost? When I left mine out first winter, all pots busted from ice. How come yours are fine? Are they not clay or cement? They are clay and cement. So the reason for that, I believe, is that we don't get enough moisture for them to kind of balloon up. So I think what happens is a lot of people get rain 
and then it freezes and the pot can't handle that expansion of the moisture inside but the pot. But we get rain and then it freezes. We get a lot of rain and then it'll freeze. Uh, not and like then, other not like other really? places. I really think that when what you call rain, it would be considered mm. a sprinkle to someone oh, else. Oh, this is cold now. <laughs> God. <laughs> um, so that's that's what I think is I think it's moisture. I think do. it's that we just don't have near the amount of moisture as other people prior to freezing. So you know how you've seen in videos people that deal with like freezing rain where like their whole car is like covered in a sheet of ice? Yeah. We never experienced that really True. here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I mean is that people people get a lot of rain and it freezes like immediately. Mm -hmm. Ours has a time, has a chance to escape maybe. Yeah. yeah, because I haven't even lost, I mean like knock on wood, I haven't lost even a terracotta pot in years yeah. because of weather and I leave them outside. Because you're in a 6B now. Yeah, yeah, that's probably it. Mark said, are Dianthus called carnations? Yes, that's another name for them. Um, Megan said, I've always wondered why you have all those plants in the greenhouse. Is it just another place that you do potted displays or are they being stored there for future projects? Um, they are for use for future projects. Some of them, um, like we'll get a lot of uh, plants that are new for like that year or the year and the next year that they, you know, companies will send mostly proven winners will send. And uh, so we can try them out here in high desert. I think that they value, and they send them to a lot of different people. I think they value hearing from different climates and different regions to see how plants do. Um, they often send them to universities who have yeah. uh, existing plant trial programs. Yeah. So they have students that um, are in horticultural programs. Mm -hmm. I think that's their preferred uh, yeah. people to send things to because they know that um, someone's grade is dependent on them taking care of sure. the plants and seeing how they do. Yeah. So anyway. Because once they get here, they're subject to me and like, do I remember to run a derper to it? I don't know. Yeah, right. <laughs> Sometimes. I know they send them to a lot of garden writers, bloggers, um, several yeah. people who do what we do, mm. you know, who um, either create blog content or social media stuff. So. Anyway, a lot of those pro uh, plants are that, and then they're also plants that we have earmarked for projects either here or we're going to be doing a couple of um, fun projects off off-site this year. And so we have things that are ready. A lot of the stuff that's in there, though, well, most of everything in there is perennial or shrub. And so once we get our high tunnel set up on the new property again, we're going to move everything out to the high tunnel, put it on drip so we don't have to hand water all of those pots every day and then that greenhouse will become complete annual storage and it'll be full of color and it'll be gorgeous okay next video is fairy house made from the garden so in that video super fun project i just walked by our flower beds and there's so many of those maple helicopters i think the, the proper name it's s-a-m-a-r-a-s -A -A samara samurais i've heard people call them different Ooh. things anyway proper term it's not helicopters that's <laughs> just some people call them whirly gigs anyway they litter uh, whirly, our garden whirly birds whirly birds not that, whirly gigs <laughs> i don't think so whirly birds that sounds right yeah okay anyway they litter our garden we have one maple tree that throws those helicopters and they're just like in every flower bed that it, we have in existence and i love the tree it's by our back sun porch gorgeous fall color beautiful shade and it's a tree we will keep but I walked by and I just saw a pile of them and I thought those kind of look like cedar shakes. I wonder if I could make some kind of a fairy something. And then I went and found some other things, some hydrangea blooms, birch bark, um, some other like tree bark, uh, branches, just some other, just random stuff out in the garden and just kind of set to making something. I set up at the kitchen table, kind of made like a prototype to see if it was something that I could actually execute on. And then we decided to make a little fairy garden from it and show you guys just an idea that you could do even in the middle of winter if you can access at least a little bit of your flower beds. I know some of you guys have complete snow and you're like, I can't do this for another month. Uh, anyway, Diana said, where uh, are those light grow stands from? So we did film in the studio because it was crummy weather and we're so thankful, remember? Oh, we were just in there looking outside thinking we are so thankful for this space. Those are the three tier sunlight LED <laughs> gardens from Gardener Supply. Um, we we got one they sent us year, one yeah they sent us one years ago i liked it so much that i bought two more so and then they came with the fluorescent tubes at that point and then we've since retrofitted them all with uh leds but i think now those sunlight three-tier gardens have three tubes per ballast mine only have two which mine grow just fine. I think the they two. still sell the, the two Do they really? Ones. Yeah. But I was looking at those like oh dang like if we ever expand our need for more grow lights It'd be kind of fun to try out one with the three tubes. 
It's uh, they are on the more expensive they side. Are. They're just convenient because you can set them up and they they look pretty good. They're a little industrial, but oh, I, I think they look. I, I agree. They do look industrial, but the fact that they're all black, they yeah. all like they're they're built for what they are used for. Like yeah. it's not something that we've cobbled together, which is nothing wrong with that. I've used those for a lot of years, like baker's racks with Larson mm. tubes. I mean, do what you got to do, and it all works great. Um, but it is nice to have the ballast that are easy to lower, like raise and lower. They fit my grow trays perfectly. They've got wheels on the bottom so we can move them around. Um, if you yeah. want to skip the research of like which, you know, which lights should I buy? How do I attach them? All those kinds of things. It's a, it's a good option. Yeah. Which I'm not a researcher by nature. You would probably research maybe a little bit more than me. Yeah. Um, I like well, I've even researched doing the grow light systems yourself, so like yeah. with the baker's racks. Mm -hmm. There's so much information out there about like the different types of bulbs and can yeah. I just get regular, right. you know, T5 bulbs, like mm -hmm. a shop light, or mm -hmm. do I need a specific type? And Well, and I did that at our last house. Remember, I had baker's racks lined up in that front bedroom. And it gets surprisingly expensive as you start building it yourself. Like you think you're going to save a ton of money by building it I yourself. I think it depends on, on what your... your objective is yeah. and I, I think you can do things for quite a bit less if you but don't. I think I think it's still more than you think Maybe. when you do it yourself it I think always after, is after you DIYs buy are all almost the pieces always yeah. more expensive I watched a video of a guy who was putting together a greenhouse um, similar to like the high tunnel like the farmer's yeah. friend one mm -hmm. and at the beginning of the video he was like just go buy one from farmer's friend <laughs> Like just it's not worth like it. it's not worth it it's yeah. not worth the effort like mm -hmm. you'll it'll save you time and it'll cost you like probably the same maybe even less after you've you know and especially all the time that you put oh. into building stuff yourself because yeah. you're kind of some people enjoy things. that process though and like more power to those people like yeah. i appreciate those kind of people who can figure out stuff like that i used to be more like that a little bit like i built that chicken coop down yeah. at the garden center that used to be in our yard it's it's with no plans at all it's like if you look at it you kind of have to look at it with your head cocked to one side <laughs> <laughs> but it's held together for years it's a four by four chicken coop that's double layer so the the coop house part is up top and then it has a little hatch door that opens and then a little ladder that goes down into a four by four run um which i built to have a couple of banny chickens at our last house and uh, it's cute. Like it's fully insulated. It has like a cedar shake roof. It has a window box on it. It's now down at the garden center, um, and has been down down there for years. Yeah, like five years or more. Yeah. Anyway, so I used to be a, well. I used to have more time to DIY stuff too before kids and stuff. It just I had a lot more time to do a lot of things. Not that I would want to go back to that, but anyway, life just evolves. Uh, okay, where was I at here? Okay, Sherry said, where are the fairies? The fairies are inside because they are tired. <laughs> That's where they're at. <laughs> I actually didn't even think about putting a fairy in that garden. We get quite a number of questions. Every time I do a miniature garden or a fairy garden that doesn't have a fairy present, we get a lot of comments. People I actually like, prefer them not to have fairies. Yeah, we're always a little bit different on that because I, I kind of feel like there needs to be that life in there. And yeah, like, I like oh. the idea of just like more of a miniature garden as opposed to a, a fairy garden. Like it doesn't need to be fairies. It can just be miniature. Sure. Except for it's a fairy garden because that's how we titled it, Eric. That's true. <laughs> you sent me the title for that video though. I did. Anna said, how long did this actually take you to make? So my prototype house took me 45 minutes maybe. Um, the actual filming of it, what do you think? An hour? Oh, two and a half. No way. Oh, yeah. No. Yep serious oh yeah oh well two and a half then <laughs> but you made the house twice i mean the you're well yeah two and a half well you... i guess when i made the house the first time i didn't complete the whole thing oh okay because i didn't complete the back i was just prototyping the roof mainly i wanted to see if the cardboard would be flexible enough um, and if it would adhere to the terracotta as good as i was hoping it would and so like the whole back side of that house i didn't finish so um yeah it took me a lot less time i can my goodness time flies i guess when you're having fun it made it really felt like it didn't take very long and i guess i didn't put the garden together during the prototype either right so okay anyway uh susan said it's benjamin fond of fairy gardens he actually is showing more interest i still had our gender announcement fairy garden sitting in the greenhouse every time we would go out there 
here I would see him playing with the little, there was a swing in it and a little fairy holding a balloon. And um, yeah, so I see him drawn to those little miniature pieces. Um, so I have a little pile of them on the underside of our potting table out there uh, that he likes to play with. So I have a little bucket of sand with a, a, a little scoop and some toys, some cars, and then some fairy garden pieces that keep him busy for a long time. He also likes to water. So if I have a pump sprayer out there, I have them um, labeled just, you know, water only so I can water seedlings and such, but he likes to water, help me water with those. And he will do that for a long time. Christy said, I can't wait to see Samantha Grace when she's older, when you make these little gardens for her. Do you have any ideas that you would want to save for then? No, I just figure like ideas just come like pretty quickly. So I figure that we'll just have some new and fun ideas once she's old enough to enjoy it. Uh, Manju said, adorable fairy house, love the helicopter shingles, brilliant. I know you've answered this before, but I can't find it. What's the brand of your cordless glue, glue gun? Um, so we were sent that glue gun in a mail time video and I love it. I will put a brand down below or we'll try to find a link. I did not use it for this project just because I knew I was gonna need to have that hot glue gun plugged in for a really long time. And a battery charge on that, I haven't actually timed it, but I was worried that it would run out and I just wanted to make sure to have a consistent source of hot glue at the ready for that project. Um, but it's been super helpful for so many different projects. So definitely worth having on hand. Grace said, so you just see things in bingo, ideas pop into your head, no browsing on Pinterest. So in some cases, like this one, I just saw the helicopters and thought I could make something. I actually never get on Pinterest ever. I never use it. Um, but I do get a lot of inspiration from people I follow on Instagram, from things I see in like magazines. I get Victoria and English Garden and Fine Gardening. Um, what other ones? But I like, I like paper copies of things. And then just life in general, you know, you see things that make you feel inspired um, or you'll see something out in your own garden that sparks something in you. Um, that's where I get a lot of inspiration. I actually get the most ideas when I'm working, um, when I'm doing something physical out in the garden or when I'm just out doing things. Like I get to see so much of nature and I feel like I would miss so much if I wasn't out doing things. Like yesterday, I got a video of a woodpecker in our lilac tree and it let me get really close to it. And I would miss, I've missed that if I wasn't outside like doing that or just being active. Um, so act activity really sparks that in me. Peggy said, I'm going to try this with my 10 year grand, 10 year old granddaughter who collects rocks, seed pods, etc. Whenever we go for walks, she plays with miniature dolls in the uh, garden too. She wants a couple of strawberry plants. Do you think we could use them as some of the plants? Absolutely. Now the fairy gardens we put together, I don't intend on any of them lasting forever and ever. Like in this one in particular, I use two very different plants, a very different watering needs, but the fact that they're separated enough in the pot, I can water them separately. And I know that the plants need that. So I would recommend that, you know, maybe a beginner gardener would pair two things together that are so unlike each other. Um, and that variety of fern in particular, I knew it would look pretty with that fairy house. I don't have very good luck with those types of ferns, period, because we're so dry here. So I kind of put it in there thinking, you'll look good for several months and then you'll probably die. <laughs> Just like knowing that from the gate uh, is helpful. But uh, strawberry plants, I think that that would be a really good idea and it would last for a little while too. So if you wanted to put together kind of a perennial garden, um, you could always just clip the runners off so that it doesn't take over or spread throughout your garden too much. Uh, last video was pre-sprouting ranunculus and anemone bulbs and a bit of organizing in the barn. So I needed to get our ranunculus and anemones going on their pre-sprouting process, which takes 10 to 14 days, which I said that in the video like eight times. And I went back through, I'm like, can I edit this out? Like hearing the words 10 to 14 days oh. that many times, like it starts to tr trigger me. I'm like, why? I, I think I forget sometimes especially when there's hours between starting the project and completing it. I forget what I've said in the beginning and there's really no way to go through all the footage and find it. So I end up repeating myself quite often and sometimes it's annoying. Anyway, I needed to get that started um, so that I'm ready to plant them out, especially with the way the weather is looking. I think we're gonna be good, good to get them going. Um, so we started that pre-sprouting process and then we, you and I went out to the barn and organized all of our garden stakes and like um, trellises, arbors, that sort of thing. I love, organ I don't love the organizing. I love the end result of the organizing. Is it kind of fun to you though, like in the process to figure it out? Cause it seems like it, like you come alive during those sorts of things. Like oh, maybe you like to get the zip ties out and the bungees out and the hooks out and the label maker out. Yeah. 
And that's why I well, love that you want to be involved or you're okay being involved in processes like that. I think I mentioned it once or twice, but I, we accumulate so much stuff yeah. that it's, it's nice to know what we have, mm-hmm. like to refresh what you have. Cause it feels so wasteful to buy something yeah. and then realize that you already had one mm-hmm. and you're just too messy enough to, yeah, it's frustrating. To know. You get yeah, it's, frustrated at it's yourself. Fra- and it also just feels gross. It feels, yeah. it feels really gross to me to buy something yeah. that you already have. Gross. Gross. It's a funny word to assign <laughs> to it, but I get it. But you know, it yeah. does. It makes you feel kind of dirty. Like, why am I like, like wasteful? Yeah. Why am I like this? Like, why am I like this? Why are you the way? That <laughs> why are you the way, <laughs> the way that you are? <laughs> okay. Irina said, "What happened to your amaryllis bulbs? The one that was in the basement? Did you plant them in the pots? Or are they still there? They're actually they need to be moved inside. So they were moved from the basement cold storage to the back sun porch just for a moment to be cut back and cleaned up, and then I meant to move them inside, and they're still out on the back sun porch, which is probably a colder treatment than they got in the basement. I hope they didn't freeze." That happened right around the time Samantha Grace was born, and a few things fell through the cracks. Like, I started a microgreens project two days after she was born. I don't know what I was thinking. I had all these trays of microgreens set out on the island and on our windowsill, and Aaron bumped one off, and it got seeds everywhere, and then I forgot to water some. And It was it pretty just, precarious where you put it. I them. know. It was, it, was, it was a bad idea to begin with. Anyway... We moved those amaryllis at just an inopportune time, and I'm really hoping they're still alive. I should move those in today. That's probably a good project to do. Uh, Terry said, how is your root cellar doing? An update, please? Yes, you will get an update in the video this week. We went and checked all the dahlia tubers. Well, not all of them, but a lot of the dahlia tubers. So you'll get to see that video and how kind of the, my thoughts on the root cellar so far. Angie said, I've never seen someone use their kitchen to plant things. Are you planning to add a sink in the new studio? We would love to have a sink in the studio but it seems like almost impossible we have a water source right there but to figure out how to bring a water source in that was we'd have to tear up the whole like we'd have to tear up the floor right Erin like to bring in a frost free version into the studio because it couldn't run outside it'd have to run it'd have to run up through the floor so we'd have to tear up the floor and we have no drain area there's no nowhere to connect it to drain it anywhere um, so, I mean, it was something we definitely considered, but like the amount of effort and money it would take to put versus in Versus the sink, benefit. But yeah, versus the benefit didn't make sense. I don't mind doing stuff in my kitchen. Like, I saw somebody was like, oh, somebody's going to have some espoma in their pepper. Because I have like the open salt and pepper things. Yeah. And I had the soil just sitting right there. And there was a big hole in the bottom of the bag of soil. It doesn't even like cross my mind. Um, Angela said, what is a garden quilt? So a garden quilt is a type of fabric you can put over some kind of hoop structure or something to protect crops or to heat up soil. There are different degrees of of fabric. So the garden quilt is the thickest one. And it's one that I got from Gardener Supply. I have it over some super hoops in the garden right now that's protecting a beautiful crop of greens that we've had growing through the winter. Um, But there's also like a summer weight fabric. There's a frost frost protection, I don't know all the proper names for all of them, but they're all for differing degrees or yeah, differing degrees of temperature. So one of them will um, just protect your crops from like bugs throughout the summer months, but it'll still allow water and light through. Some will just protect from like a light frost. The garden quilt is the thickest, so it protects from the coldest temperatures. Um, Anyway, so it depends on the time of year and what you're using it for, what kind of fabric you would need. Beverly said, do you water in the basement during the cool two-week period? You shouldn't need to with all the pre-moistened soil. I mean, 10 to 14 days in a cool temperature like that, you'll probably maintain moisture in the soil the whole time. We will be checking. In fact, we should go down there today, Erin, um, and like... Check on them? Well, I, I guess I could, go down, I could go down there by myself and check on them and make sure we don't have any, any rotting or oh. anything. So I could do that. Um, Leslie said, I've never grown anemones, but I have, uh, I do have seed to start. Well, I have to dig them up and at the end of the season and save them in order to plant them again next year. Kind of like you do dahlias in certain growing climates. Yes. Um, technically I wouldn't have to dig mine because we are now a zone six B and I think you're good to plant anemones and a zone six, like in the fall and you can let them winter over and you might have to protect, provide them a little bit of protection with a quilt. If you dip a little bit colder than normal. Um, Ranunculus are zone seven or above. So it's a, just a little bit different for each one of those crops. Now there are different kinds of, of anemones. So the anemones that I planted or um, am pre-sprouting are like the corm or bulb type. 
there are perennial type of anemones too that we have in our garden that spread like crazy like the they're japanese anemones um so there's like um i can't even remember the name it's a white one that's beautiful there's pink ones um there's fall in love sweetly which doesn't spread quite as as much as the older varieties of anemones and it stays a little bit smaller um so anyway i just know that those don't need to be dug up those are a perennial in our zone for sure lana said always look forward to your videos before my days start it gives me some great inspiration uh, question, there was one potato root that appeared to not get covered. Oh, I forgot I planted potatoes at the end of that video. When I was in the basement, I found the basket of uh, potatoes that I had dug from our garden that I had accidentally pierced with my shovel. Um, and so I was, I meant to eat those quicker, like to use those in our kitchen quicker. And I forgot I put them in the basement. Anyway, a bunch of them had sprouted. Like there was only one that looked like it dried up. There wasn't any rot or anything. I mean, they were desiccated. Um, they were starting to dry up, but I thought, you know what? I might be able to get away with planting these. And so I grabbed a galvanized tub that has drainage holes in the bottom and some soil biotone starter fertilizer and planted them up in the cold frame and we'll see what happens. Um, so the question was that there was one potato root that appeared to not get covered in the soil. Um, so that was like a growth shoot. So that's where some roots or some leaves rather will um, form. That wasn't an actual root. So the potato is where the roots will come out. And then that was a growth shoot that will come out and produce plant. So. Anyway, it was so long that I couldn't get that one covered. And then I didn't cut any, I had some questions about like, oh, so you just plant potatoes whole? You can, um, you can also cut them and uh, making sure that there's just a couple of eyes on each. We've done videos about proper ways to plant potatoes. In this case, because I'm dealing with dried up smaller potatoes, oftentimes it had a cut that had dried. I just decided to plant them whole and just, I think that's the best, our best chances su uh, at success, of success, anyway. Last question. Laura, will you show what you see around your property now with things going through change? That's part of all the excitement, seeing the process. Yes, we have pretty much filmed everything that has gone on here. Um, like we showed you when the pines came out, when the tool shed left. Um, we'll show when we take the plants out from around the gazebo. We'll film when the gazebo leaves. So we've tried to film as much of the uh, new property process as possible. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't look like an enormous amount has gone on up there. Isn't it kind of sad, Aaron? Like the infrastructure part, like oftentimes is the most expensive mm -hmm. and it, it's the least visible. Yeah. Like, I mean, we have electric and water buried. We had, um, you know, all the way around the perimeter of the property. We have um, a new well that was dug. Um, the arbs were planted, that is visible. We planted the trees along the lane. I think what slowed us down last year was the cut flower garden being in the wrong location. Oh, I just plunked it right out. Yeah, and it was fine, but it prohibited us from being able to put the road through where we yeah. wanted it to go, so we had to wait. And it's really hard. You can't really plant a whole lot else without exactly knowing where it the road's going to be. It doesn't even make me sad, though. That was such a it fun It was a successful project. tough garden. Oh, my gosh. Like, I cannot wait for it this year. I mean, it'll be in the proper spot this year, in a spot where it's not going to move. And I plan on setting it up much like it looked last year, but in the in the end, it'll become much more formal, I think. I don't know that I'll do, I mean, maybe I'll keep it row crop style, but based on how I'm using it, like I'm not growing things to sell. Um, and so I like maximum production isn't as important as somebody who's growing things to make an income off of it. Um, anyway, so I think I can maybe manipulate it to be a little bit more decorative in the end. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But anyway, that was the last question for this week's recap video. I hope it was helpful to hear some of these answers. It's kind of fun to sit down and just like regroup. This kind of almost feels like a weekly podcast. Well, now I mean, that you mic up, I love it. Now, see, we just need to get Aaron a chair that he can sit in next <laughs> to me. You should. Yeah. Everybody vote. No, no vote votes. Vote for Aaron, yes. No vote votes. for Aaron sitting in. No one's voting. Well, I'm just glad that you mic up at least. That's good. Because we offer very different perspectives on things, sure. I think. Yeah. Like, you think of things I don't, and I might, I might think of things that you don't. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, hope you guys are all having a great day. Have a great week, everybody, and we will see you in the next video. Bye.